Hello, and welcome back to the What The Fork podcast in association with Viper Goalkeeping. Hello and welcome back to the What The Fork podcast. We have another Sunderland special today and I'm absolutely delighted to be speaking to one of the most iconic names in British football. Welcome to the show, Sam Allardyce. How are you doing, Sam? Are you all right? I'm good, thank you very much. How are yourselves? Getting by, mate. Certainly a lot better to be speaking to you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much. Yes, well, plenty of time on my hands to to, uh, do a little bit of broadcasting through Zoom podcasts uh, I've never been so uh, up to date on technology as I have in the last uh, lockdown over the last two months or so. So uh, uh, even uh, an old funny dude like me can do Skype, Facebook, Zoom. Um, so I'm uh, w- well aware of that technology now. And I have to say, it's been very important for everybody, this technology throughout this, uh, this very difficult period for us all. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, first things first, obviously, really, really quickly, I think that you're currently head ambassador for a grassroots sports sort of initiative. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, my club is um, uh, something that uh, um, I got introduced to a few years ago now where um, they're trying to uh, go around to football clubs at the moment. They're just starting a, a lottery by going through the foundation, helping with grants, so on and so forth. And it's um, it's about paying the paying the club back uh, a part of the income that comes into into my club and giving it back to the football club to help with the obviously very difficult times now. But what's always been difficult in grassroots football, and that is raising enough finance to support youngsters at any age or in any sport, not just football, uh, to uh, try and enjoy themselves, enjoy participating in sport, whatever that sport might be. And we all know how difficult it is by... Uh, the help of volunteers and parents, but also the, the cost today um, is ever more increasingly difficult to raise. So uh, it's in its infancy, it's, not, it's getting better. And uh, many people in sport are, uh, are trying to, uh, to support it, but hopefully um, in the next few years it'll become, it'll become much bigger and uh, give much more back to a lot of grassroots sports. Now, we are here specifically to speak about the, the, your time at Sunderland, which seems like a lifetime ago to many Sunderland fans. Hopefully, it's not to you. Um, but spoke to Niall Quinn last year, as it was. And before we go into you actually joining Sunderland, I think he said he tried to appoint you when he first took over as chairman. I think you would have been a Bolton. So before you actually became manager, had you been close to becoming Sunderland manager in the past? Well, I had a huge consideration over it. Um, but uh, obviously, Sunderland and, uh, and Niall, particularly combination, I thought was absolutely fantastic. I think that um, it was proven to be a fantastic combination by what uh, what the club achieved in that period of time. 
Um, but unfortunately, I was on an unbelievable journey at Bolton Wanderers, um, which is obviously, as everybody well knows, my my first love as a as an apprentice at fifteen and and making the making the grade in the first team and then managing the team um, was particularly uh, important to me. Um, so. Unfortunately, at that time, it was the wrong timing for me, and I had to decline Nile. And, um, and and lo and behold, later on, I got there. Yeah, you did. In the end, thank God. Um, yeah. As it was, the team that you took over at the time, I think it would be it wouldn't be unfair to You're say. Not to forget, Graham, I played for Sunderland. Of course, time, but I actually turned out at Roker Park a few and times. So Ken Knighton, I uh, believe. It was Ken Knighton and Frank Clark, but unfortunately, the difficulties. Um, that we we had to face with um, uh, Mr. Kerry, the chairman at the time, and the difficulties that Ken and Frank had, I sort of fell in the middle of that. Uh, this was my big move first time from Bolton, and uh, I thought I'd uh, chosen very, very well. But internal politics, unfortunately, didn't just affect Ken and Frank at the time, it affected me um, massively to have a longer career at Sunderland because of the unfortunate situation of being unable to move my family into the area things became uh, quite um, quite difficult for me being away from my two young children so uh, I had to call it a day but uh, it was a good experience in the short time I had I did enjoy working with um, Ken and Frank uh, particularly friends with Frank with the LMA um, and and it particularly enjoyed the the Roker crowd at the time as I, as I did at the Stadium of Light when I was manager. So you had like the, the season at Sunderland, I think 80 to 81. So how much did that play a role in you joining the club sort of when you did? Or how much did those memories come into play when you took over like managing Sunderland? Yes, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it played a part, but also uh, the uh, experience of um, being at Sunderland for a small period of time with, with Peter Reid. And the journey he took to get um, Sunderland back into the into the, the Premier League and what a great journey he had. And my uh, my conversation with my big mate Peter was uh, the affection he had with with Sunderland Football Club and and the passion that was there and uh, which which obviously I knew. But obviously in the stadium light, you know you've got even an even bigger crowd, an even bigger passion, and uh, and, and that was a. Uh, a big reason of um, of moving up to Sunderland to try and help them in their difficult times. And of course, I have to say, and a lot of Sunderland fans um, maybe not realise this, but um, the conversation with Ellis Shaw was critical. Uh, and um, I know a lot of Sunderland fans dislike Ellis, but in my short period of time there, uh, I'd have to say, without his support at that time, particularly in January with buying the new players we bought. Um, it, it, I'm not sure that even I could have saved Sunderland at that time. So uh, we, we did work quite well together. Um, and we did all pull in the same direction, which is massively important for you to try and get a club out of trouble that's in great difficulty. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, when you took over the club and I've, I've wrote down here in my questions, it was a, a team that was losing weekly, seemingly devoid of confidence with with ability in there, but looking seeming like it was ready for relegation. So I think it wouldn't be unfair again for me to say you've taken on some big, big jobs in your time. But how big was that challenge at Sunderland when you first took over? Well, I mean, nine, was it three points in nine games? And I think that um, uh, the the... I think the beauty is to get off to a good start, not just um, a good start, but a very impressive start that you show the Sunderland fans that, you know, maybe we might go in the right direction. And while we lost 1-0 at West Brom, we had the massive um, 3-0 win against our old rivals up the road, Newcastle United. Um, So that gave everybody a lot of joy six in a row I think the Sunderland fans were singing uh, it got me off and running with three very very cr- crucial points um, and started the ball rolling and uh, we didn't overcome our diff- difficulties after that because as a manager that's the most difficult time for you is finding out about everybody not just on the pitch but off the field and uh, building a rapport with everybody to try and get them all pulling the same direction because 
when you uh, have experienced like I have going into a struggling football club, there are lots of different factors and a lot, a lot of people are, if you're, if you're like trying to protect themselves and not all pulling in the same direction. So you've got to build that trust and uh, uh, build that confidence on and off the field and getting everybody support. You can't just do it yourself. I found it quite interesting. I listened to an interview with you uh, about the le- um, labels and things like that, that you sort of put on yes. players and, and people in general. Um, one player that for me literally was night and day and has been night and day ever since you, you got hold of him basically was Patrick Van Anhol. Um, yes. He improved immensely, but he did have that label of a left back that doesn't know how to defend and so on and so forth. But what was it during your time with, with PVA? What did you work on with him during that time? And how did you, obviously I know you don't use labels. So how did you approach that situation? Because obviously there's a cracking player in there. I think that uh, the, the, the beauty about working with Patrick Van Arnold is the abundance of talent that he has. So you're not asking him to do something he hasn't got in his locker. Yeah. It's just about his understanding of what he should be able to do with the ability that he's got. So while we didn't have to work too much on the going forward, which is a great bonus because the amount of assists today that a fullback is responsible for and goals is massive. But there's two ways to play football, as we all know. One's in possession and one's out. And Sunderland's record defensively, and this was the whole of the team, and particularly the defence and the goalkeeper, was abysmal. So while we wanted to go and play an attack, we were terrible at defending as a team for one, and certainly the back four and the goalkeeper weren't playing as much as they possibly could do as a unit. And uh, and that was something that, um, uh, particularly with Patrick, uh, you had to improve on the training ground and show what's missing in terms of his defensive ability and what has to get better in terms of his defensive qualities. And I'm not so sure, even from his Chelsea days, that he'd ever been shown the basics, really and the basics of defending when a player coming into his area, what, what you need to do and what you need to think about. For instance, if he's, if he's right-footed, you don't let him go down the right-hand side of you and, and, or the left-hand side of you and cross the ball, show him inside. You know, if he's particularly quick, give yourself an extra yard, get your right body position. Um, if a cross is coming in from the other side, don't be... F- 15, 20 yards away from your central defender um, and thinking the goal is going to catch it and throw it to you. That's not your responsibility is to get alongside your central defender and defend that ball that comes in the box. And then you break out and try and get involved in the play. So it was those simple things and those simple basics that I spent some time with Patrick and the other coaches, which eventually he took on board and, and got extreme. But now this wasn't going to detract from his attacking play. Because mm-hmm. his attacking play is very important and a big strength of his game. It's it's his you know his big plus, and uh, and I have to say I was glad to say that when I signed him at Crystal Palace from Sunderland, it, he didn't it didn't take a lot of time to get him back in that mode because obviously Crystal Palace were just in as big a uh, struggling position uh, as was Sunderland when I took over. Talking about but a terrific things. player, terrific player. I mean, yeah, I even got the Dutch player. side, didn't he? I mean, even yeah. got the Dutch national side, like you mean. So the only thing with Patrick is, as a manager, you have to be able to handle personalities. Yeah. And he is a big, massive personality, this lad, which can uh, and, uh, and, and probably does get under some manager's fingernails. But I found it um, quite interesting uh, having, the, having the chat with him. So... Uh, it, it was uh, it was really good to uh, work with him and all the other players because of what we all achieved together in the end. Talking about players that improved when you were there, and it goes under the radar a little bit, this one, because of the Ferrari that surrounded Sunland Association Football Club for the past however many years. Jack Rodwell didn't have the best of times at Sunland as, on a whole, but in the period that you were there, and people kind of remember this, we started seeing that Jack Rodwell that we thought we'd signed um, obviously, you left and things changed, and we'll come on to that. But what is it that you did with Jack Rodwell that started 
him actually turning into a decent player and the player that we thought he was meant to be. Well, this was a psychological. Jacks was, Jacks was um, uh, having had a, a very, very good start to his career with Everton and then uh, moving to Manchester City, which I think destroyed any, what, any confidence he had in himself. And Sunderland couldn't find, um, couldn't find a way to reinstill the sort of confidence that he had when he was in his Everton days. So as individuals, you have to assess every player that you, you work with as individuals. You can't treat them all the same. So a Jack, six foot two, left footed, right footed, fit, strong, um, but had this, this unbelievable um, lack of confidence which I felt led to a lot of what we called niggly injuries. Mm -hmm. And the niggly injuries would be brought about by the, the, the psychological barriers that he was facing. So we had to overcome that by making him feel good and by addressing the things he, were fe he was feeling psychologically and physically. So along with the rest of the staff, um, and, and um uh, Matt, Matt, a lad I worked with at uh, Crystal Palace, Matt, uh, we used to bring him up uh, doing um, a lot of this uh, uh, Cairo practitioner's work. He was particularly unique in uh, how he did it. And, um, and a lot of that uh, work he did would help. And there's a lot of that psychological support was about getting him fit mentally and, and physically. And then we didn't get this 20 minutes in, half an hour, an hour, the waving of the hand saying, I'm feeling my hamstring, or in training, I'm feeling my groin, or I'm feeling my calf. And a lot of the physios were puzzled by that situation because when he had the scan, it didn't appear that there was anything particularly wrong with him. That's why I went to, this is a psychological barrier, which we seem to overcome. And uh, Jack, um, smashing guy, you know, really, you know, really desperate to play football, really desperate to show he was worth the money Sunderland paid for him. And eventually we managed to get him back on the field and playing a little bit more like we all knew what he did at Everton. Yeah, absolutely. So that, was a, that was a challenge. It was a, ch it was a challenge because before I got there, he'd, he'd almost, I think he'd almost nearly almost been written off that he can't stay ever fit enough to play 90 minutes. Yeah, pretty much how it came across and there was the papers and all that that went with it. But it goes under the radar that you look at Van Anholt, Kirchhoff and so on and so forth. But Rodwell did have an uprising during the time that you were there, um, which kind of leads me on perfectly to the next question, really. I think you've long been known as someone who's a lover of modern technology and sports science and yeah. one of the first people to use it. Um, and a lot of people I've interviewed you were there during your time loved that you implemented that. But which elements of the sports science work particularly well at Sunland and with which players did you use it on? Well, I think that, uh, that, that psychologically, um, we, we promoted the players uh, to uh, overcome the, the criticisms they were getting and the deficiencies uh, that they felt uh, um, we had in the, in the backroom staff and, and we motivated everybody to work harder, work longer, work better, work better rather than work longer. And uh, the support of the players would breed, breed a lot of confidence in them. Our direction would be to, to direct the players uh, week in and week out what they needed to do for themselves, not just by us, the trainers and coaches, physios, masseurs, um, strength and conditioning, all that, all that stuff that went along with um, what you do week in and week out, but also the fact that they need to know and need to help themselves along the way. They don't need to always have to ask for a coach or a physio or a strength and conditioning coach or a fitness coach or a nutrition to be coming to them and say, come and do this. We will give you what you need. We will plan out what you need. And when you've got an opportunity, you can work out that yourself. If you do want to have a coach or whatever person with you, that's fine. But generally, we're very busy looking after 35, 40 players on a daily basis. It doesn't stop you doing that particular sort of um, 
strength in terms of working on what you need to uh, on your own. So come in a little bit earlier, do half an hour before we start training, do half an hour in the afternoon before you go home. Do It's only small bits and only small gains we're looking for. So I think when you come into a football club and you're desperate, the, the, the lads seem to think that they've got to expand their game by a huge percentage in actual fact. If everybody plays just 1% better, you know, you've at least got 11% better performance overall. And that can make a massive difference. And the simple things then go to, if we stop the goals going in, we lead, need fewer goals to win a game. It's a simple fact. So we put that stat together. We then put it on the, on, in the analysis room, which, we, which plays a massive part today. We put it up in, 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 in easy reading and say, if we achieve this in the next six games, that's our target. This will move us up the league. So we're doing it in small batches and small doses of trying to encourage the players to achieve this much in that six games instead of just letting one game go past at a time and then another game, another game, without reviewing it. So they've got a target for six games. Can we hit that target? And, um, and, and it, I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean it's going to work at your football club that you've taken over. But in, in other words, recently, that sort of, it does get modified depending on what club you're at. But that has stood me in good stead through nearly every club I've managed now, particularly in the Premier League. And whether that's been out of trouble or with Bolton to achieve the success we did. So it's, it's, if you like, it stood the test of time by giving players some analysis. The opportunity to down information on their iPads or their iPhones is massively important now as well because, you know, you could download 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It could be motivational. It could be about themselves. For, for instance, may, maybe Jermaine wanted his last 10 goals and they put a bit of music to it. And that made him feel good. He could watch it whenever he felt like it, feel better when he came in. So I think all, all along, eventually, bit by bit, we started to feel better about ourselves, uh, mentally more than physically, because I think they were pretty fit when I took over anyway. But mentally, they were much stronger by probably the middle of January, going towards the end of it. We're not loaded on time, but there's a couple of questions. So if people think I'm jumping a little bit forward here, I definitely am. Um, many people point to the Chelsea and the Everton games as the most memorable of your era. And it's hard to, it's hard to argue that. But for you as a yeah. manager, I know you view that differently sometimes. Which game was it for you where you watched and you went, we've turned a corner on that. That's how I want my team to play. Uh, I think Man United beat Man United at home. Yeah. I think that We'd, um, we drew with Liverpool 2-2, two, two, coming from 2-0 down. Yeah, good game. And, uh, and I think that there, there was, a, the, you know, if you look at, at how we got out of trouble and you take Liverpool one point, Manchester United three points, Chelsea three points, and Everton three points, those are the biggest teams in, or, you know, Everton not as big as the other three, but certainly big enough at the yeah. top end with Roberto, um, to take that amount of points from those teams is is the reason all the other bread and butter stuff we did was was what we needed to do. That was going to give us the basis of staying in the Premier League. But ultimately, somewhere, we had to shock somebody. But I didn't think we would shock so many teams and play so well in those games. Uh, so I think the turning point for the players, more than anything else, was 2-0 down at Liverpool away from home and turning that back into a 2-2. And I have to say, one of the most difficult periods of my time outside of football was the, it was the Johnson scenario. You know, it, this, was a, this was an extremely difficult period. We're in the middle of a, um, a relegation battle, but then you have this massive off the field problem that's that's pressurising everybody concerned at the football club and having to deal with that publicly in the press was a 
um, a, a, pr a pretty difficult time for me. Um, I didn't think I should have had to deal with it, but unfortunately, there was at the time there was nobody else there to deal with it. So I tried to do the best I could. In a situation like that, you just have to show. I mean, like I agree with you. I don't think you should have had to front up your absolutely nothing to do with you but because you're seen as like the leader of the club do you have to take that role forward to kind of almost protect the other players as well and protect their own mental health uh, yes I, of course I, but you know the the, the uh, I, 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 I really couldn't understand why at the time they agreed to the trial at that particular time right in the middle of the season mm -hmm. I don't know how that or why that happened, but of course I'm not a legal mind. I'm just a football manager. But you know, it was it was a, a sad sad period of time. We had to get over very quickly and move on. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course uh, we did, and we and we uh, we moved on brilliantly. I, I think I don't know. You've got to tell me this because my my mind. Did we only lose? Was it two games in the last ten? Uh, three in the last 15 in total, so potentially two in the last yeah. 10. And one was Leicester, who were, were beating everyone. And I think from a yeah. Sunderland fan's perspective, that's what makes it so frustrating, um, which probably leads me on to one big question that there's a lot of rumours that surround it. I don't think anyone could have blamed you for going to England. No one on this planet can say, yeah. oh, why has you gone to England over Sunderland? It's England, it's your dream job, and everyone knew that. And I think everyone thought, frustratingly enough for us, you were the right man for the job at that time as well. But there's a lot of rumours that kind of swirled around that you wouldn't have stayed anyway. There's a big, big rumour in Sunderland. You would have I would stayed. Have. Good. I would have stayed. Yes. Yeah, I would have stayed. I met with Ellis um, uh, before the before the England job came up, and I had no idea, not even the faintest hope of being the England manager that season or that summer. I hadn't got even an inkling that he was ever going to be close to me being uh, being able to acquire that position. Me and Alice had um, met uh, uh, privately in London, and uh, I'm a big man on uh, uh, sitting together and, and um, getting everything out in the open. Yeah. Um, Ellis is a straight talker, so am I. I think that's probably why we had a mutual respect for each other. So we hammered out the way forward um, for the next season. And um, obviously, some of my recommendations would not fall into line with Ellis's, and some of Ellis's recommendations would not fall into line with me. So we were—I wouldn't say we would—we we totally put put that to bed and, and agreed on which way we're going. But we certainly did about 65, 70 percent of where we had to go. And of course, from my point of view, it was about. I think what the team had done, we couldn't rest on our laurels and say, we have now got a team that's lost two in 10 or three in 15. Um, if we stay as we are, that won't continue next season. So I would say that four players that couldn't be freeze or couldn't be loan players, uh, unless it was a, a JJ, a Kocher or a Nicholas and Elka or a, we persuaded a, a, a massive player to come at that stage um, or an outer contract player of that type. Yeah. We had to go out and purchase more players of the right quality. So I think that the four, the four players, one on loan and three we bought, had emphasised that we made the right choices and it would be probably the right choices we would make again in the summer. Because obviously from Ellis's problem, and I could understand this, there had been some bad choices previously where players had arrived, hadn't performed to their level and actually left with the club losing vast amounts of money they'd, they'd actually paid. And that was a particular problem that Sunderland had at that particular time. So 65, 70% I was through the, the budgets and, uh, um, and, and I think that that was a very, very good meeting and uh, was feeling pretty confident for about the the fact that my focus was that, uh, and all the players is that we are not going to start next season like you've done the last four or five. Yeah, I think it was huge. Um, one big player that still breaks my heart that he never joined, Jan Vila. Would he have been one of the first on your shopping list if you'd stayed? 
Yes, I think so. I think that I mean, one, I mean, I mean, the one thing that we had we had in the bag for at least another season was the fact that you know, let's you, you haven't mentioned him yet, but I will. Is that um, the the J- J- Jermaine Defoe? Yeah, the Jermaine Defoe can't play up front on his own. Oh, why can Jermaine Defoe not play up front on his own? Because he doesn't like it. Yeah. Has anybody asked him? Well, I don't know. Oh, well, all right, okay, well, I will. Okay, so in the first few games, I've been told that that's a problem for him. And if you play him out right, wide right or you play him out left, and I'm a big uh, 4 3 3 man, as you, as you all know, uh, you know, midfield today needs to be mastered. And I think that. I think that um, uh, Jermaine had played the Fletch or whoever at the time, and we were just so short in midfield. We were just losing possession, and it was always difficult for us to keep possession at that stage. But we would end up down to about twenty percent possession in all of the game and losing games of football. So I asked him, uh, "Is it all right if you play up front on own, on your own? Are you okay with that?" He went. Yeah, I'm okay with that. So he said, why? I said, well, I've been told that you can't. He said, well, nobody's really asked me. So I think that, if, if, you know, when you talk, well, you talked about labels before. Yeah. Um, so, so here I am, long ball Sam, playing Jermaine Defoe up front at five foot eight. So I think it puts to bed any, any facts of the matters that we, we played any lot, lot, long ball football at Sunderland with Jermaine, Jermaine Defoe up front in, 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 on his own at five foot nine. You now, the beauty about Jermaine Defoe was 18 goals. Yeah. Um, and, and, and waited patiently in some games, particularly away from home. I mean, they scored the equaliser at Liverpool away. Uh, brilliant goal. Great goal. Back to goal. Rolled the defender, volleyed it in, and he'd barely had 10 touches in the game. And that just shows you what a professional he is. I never met a professional that wouldn't, wouldn't moan or groan when he came in off the field about the fact he's not getting enough service, he's not getting enough chances. And of course, as time went on, those chances improved tremendously because of the way we were playing and the amount of times we were attacking the opposition, particularly at all. And the amount of goals that he scored, having very few chances. This was one of, I think there's only, I can only point to him and Nicholas and Elka uh, in my time on pure goal scorers of the highest quality. Yeah. And so that was our number one priority for the next season. Can we get Jermaine Defoe to score 18 goals again next season? If we can do that, we're not going to struggle. I'm, I'm sure we won't struggle. And if we can build on what we achieved in the back end of last season, um, we can we can find ourselves in a mid-table position very early on. I mean, nothing more than that. But you know, that's better than what previous seasons had, had we'd been fighting against. You know, which was always relegation. Got two quick ones left for you because I know we're on a bit of a time scale. But one of the big ones for me was after you left. I think some of them made a few mistakes. Uh, we'll not go into them too much, but two of the players that were brought in were Didier Ndong, Papi Dilabodji. And many people had said that these were players that were originally earmarked by yourself previously and they weren't the David Moyes sign-in. Straightforward question. Were there players that you wanted to bring in or were there David Moyes sign-ins? Honestly, um, I find that difficult to actually say yes or no to. Mm -hmm. Um, Which one did did Didier Ndong come from? Uh, Didier came from uh, it was from well, I think the uh, Delabodji was Chelsea, and it was. I wasn't, I wasn't signing him. I think it I was, was never signing Dele, I wasn't signing Delabodji or Dele, Dele, De Jong. No, no, I would. I wouldn't have got rid of um, the, the centre. I was centre half for him. I wouldn't have got rid of um, Eunice. <laughs> Eunice Cabal. Another great guy. Football, and then they'd the, the played a brilliant second half of the season with me, and uh, and I didn't see any any reason to to let him go. I mean, Moyes is my big mate, and has been my big mate for many many years, of course. And he found a 
unfortunately for Sunderland and for him, he found the job extremely difficult, which, which I have to say did surprise me. But mm -hmm. um, the other guy was, I think we'd seen him um, in I France. Lorient he played for, so he would have came Lorient, from the same yeah, team as we signed, um, Kone. Yeah, Kone, yeah. So, so did Lamy Kone. Um, but he was, a, he was a future star. We saw him as a future player, I think 19, yeah, 20, something like that. Yeah, playing yeah, regular. But we sent the Premier League and where we are at the moment, um, if we spent that sort of money, everybody would expect him to play in the first team straight away. And he wasn't ready for the Premier League, being, being so young, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And the last question that's been on everyone's lips, um, when I've asked what one question they would ask Sam Allardyce, if anything, about Sunderland, everyone said, when are you coming back? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not certain that the challenge that's facing Sunderland at the moment would, uh, uh, would be something that I would uh, like to take on. If I was um, 40, 30, 38, 40, 41 points, I'd be there like a shot. But uh, the, unfortunately, uh, the Sunderland fans, are, I'd have to excuse them and say, I'm very sorry, but no. <laughs> Sam, thank you very much. Hugely appreciated. Um, I hope, obviously, all this is over soon. Everyone gets back to go watching football and I hope to see you back. I hope to see yeah. you back in the North East at some point and hopefully us in the Premiership as well. And I have to say this just to finish. That, um, uh, at the end of the season, uh, when I sat down with Ellis and uh, and uh, some of the some of the staff, when I got back, that uh, forty three thousand average attendance uh, and their support um, probably gained us eight nine points at the stadium of life. There's no doubt about that support making a massive difference to our our fight and we did it all together in the end not just me and the staff and the players but the supporters uh, it was a great journey for me I have to say I didn't enjoy the first six weeks <laughs> trying to get through all the rubbish that was there and all the problems but once we came out the back of that and started in January uh, it was an absolute pleasure especially with the suit moment as well I didn't even touch on that yeah well I know fantastic of, I like a bit of reaction a bit of passion in it you know what I mean we like a team like mate. And I think that's why it worked. But again, Sam, as always, thanks so much for your time. Uh, stay safe. Hopefully get out this soon. Hopefully see you back in the game very much soon, mate. All right? Okay, thank you.